I'm very happy to uh, have here today Pamela, Julia, Laura, and Andrea. And as like as a panelist for today's session, it's all about psych psychedelics, uh, the new fountain of uh, use and longevity. So, and we have uh, prepared a few questions for for you. And of course, everybody who is in the uh, session, um, do ask your own questions as usual. I would like for Pamela, uh, Julia, Laura, and Andrea to introduce themselves in just a moment. But before that, just very quick word about the three co-founders co of the Women for Longevity Club. Um, Claudia, do you quickly want to introduce yourself and Nina? Sure, I'm excited to have everyone on today. So thank you so much for coming. I'm Claudia from Böselager, co-founder with Ines and Nina or Nicolina. Um, I am biohacker coach and founder of Longevity and Lifestyle, also have a podcast as well. Um, so it's such an exciting space and really, really excited to have so many of you fantastic women in this space together in the club. And our other co-founder who is getting or getting on or getting off a flight, I didn't quite catch it before. Oh, hopefully uh, off. <laughs> off a flight. Yeah, Nina Nicolina um, is co uh, well, co-founder and CEO of Glycan Age, which uh, she's on a mission to unlock the human glycone for preventative health and longevity. So also a biological age testing company. And uh, Claudia, by any chance, do you have a tip, especially go, maybe oh, going through COVID? <laughs> I have COVID at the moment, so I'm at the end, but this is a year that my main overarching theme is around mindsets and mindset rewiring. And so one of the hacks that I really liked um, that I learned is to swap the words have to, like I have to do something with get to. So I get to pick up my kids. I get to get up in the morning. So um, anyone working on mindset rewiring, um, swapping have to with get to is a tip for me. Thank you. Okay, uh, who am I? I'm Ines O'Donovan. Uh, I'm well, the founder of Genesima and Genesima Academy and uh, editor-in-chief for Genesima Magazine. And uh, we are adding on the Younger Everyday Wisdom Days this year. So our first one is in March, menopause, uh, turn down the heat. So it should be quite interesting. So basically we do share like the latest research, uh, tips, technologies, innovative ideas, uh, products, etc., with women who want to be super healthy, perform at their best, and uh, maybe hopefully live a little bit longer. So that's what we do. And mine, is, it's not a tip as such, but uh, I saw like a research that I, well, it's not the actual research, it's a pre-research that I thought was quite interesting. The hypothesis of are psychedelics linked to telomere links? So there was uh, from, I'm not sure how this person's pronounced, German, German, uh, like in 2019, who hypothesized that theoretically, um, the psychedelics are linked to improving depression. It's one topic we're talking about today as well, I assume. Um, and uh, that related on to that, then maybe we can lengthen telomeres. Would be really interesting. Anyway, let's get uh, to our panel. And uh, I would like to start with you, Pamela. Um, maybe each of you introduces uh, kind of herself very briefly as well. What are you doing? How did you get into psychedelics? <laughs> No, that's not a brief conversation, Ines, but thank you. So I'm Dr. Pam Cusco. I'm a Canadian MD. Um, I'm a professor and instructor at two different universities in British Columbia and Canada. Uh, I'm also a researcher in um, psychedelic medicines, chronic pain, uh, microdosing, and uh, neurogeneration. And I'm the medical lead on two psychedelic-assisted therapy programs with two of my colleagues here, Laura and Andrea, uh, one with ketamine assisted therapy and another with psilocybin assisted therapy. And um, when I'm not doing all that, I prefer to be in the forest, hiking around, getting some good activity, some good exercise or out in my kayak on the ocean. And I'm also an avid permaculture gardener. And how did I get into psychedelics? Um, Wow. Well, they found me at 15. That's the easy story um, or the simple story. But uh, about 10 years ago, I realized that uh, psychedelics could come back into medicine. And so I knew the potential. I knew what was possible. And so as the door started opening, 
to come back into that research. I jumped in with both feet to see what I can do to, to bring our, to assist with these medicines coming back in to help our patients. And ultimately my goal is to put myself out of a job. <laughs> it's not a bad one because there are always other things we can do. <laughs> Uh, Julia, what about you? So I'm Julia Mirror. I'm a recovering physician. I, I realized that I wasn't buying what I was selling back in 2018 when I was in my residency. I resigned and kind of found my way to psychedelic assisted therapy and have since then positioned myself to be involved in the three pillars that I see moving the space forward, which is the policy, the clinics, and the research. So for clinics, I'm involved in the ketamine clinic as director of strategy. Um, actually, when I met Pam, she became like my beacon of light in this space. And everything that she does very much informs what I hope to do here in the States. Um, I'm involved in psilocybin research currently through, I'm a, one of the two uh, practitioners that sit with the patient when they get their dose for major depression. And that same organization is expanding. We're bringing in all the other um, molecules as well for research. And then from a policy standpoint, um, I advise for the Psychedelic Medicine Coalition, which is lobbying the NIH for a $100 million grant for psychedelic research. And the way that I got into this was very much by accident. Um, you know, burnt out physician tried something that I didn't know was going to help as much as it did. And it just shifted my entire life into this work. Thank you so much for having me be here. Fascinating. Well, I'm so glad to have you, <laughs> all of you. Laura, what about you? Tell us more about yourself and your own story. Sure, thank you. Um, so yeah, my name is Laura McLean and I am a, a medical doctor. I specialize in sleep medicine. Um, before sleep, I, uh, I was uh, an internal medicine intensive care specialist and a lung specialist. Um, I shifted into sleep about 10 years ago or so. Um, and, uh, so my, my, uh, introduction or the way I kind of came into the, the, uh, psychedelics was, the, uh, a kind of a very personal story. I was chugging along in my career and, you know, working hard and trying to bring in the money and, you know, all that stuff. Um, when I got diagnosed with breast cancer and I suddenly had to stop everything and focus on treatment. And during that year off, I had a lot of time to reflect on what's important, where, what do I want to do with my life? Where do I want to go? And one of the first things I did actually, is I kind of, um, I decided the way I was practicing and what I was doing wasn't really fulfilling. And I got interested in lifestyle medicine. And so I studied and, and I've become a lifestyle medicine specialist as well. I just got my uh, boards uh, in December for that. So I'm super excited. I joined a lifestyle medicine clinic with some very like-minded colleagues. Um, and then along the way as well, I was doing some reading about psychedelics and my friend Andrea, who lives next door to me and who's my very good friend, was telling me about this program that she's involved with called Roots to Thrive Ketamine Assisted Therapy and, and about the amazing things they were finding as they were bringing uh, participants through with PTSD, depression, anxiety. Um, and she and I thought, well, you know, I've kind of had a, a tough year and I'm on to new things and maybe I should just go through. And so, so, so I went through as a participant, um, and, and it, uh, you know, not thinking there was going to be, you know, as much to it as there, there was, I, I thought, well, it'll be interesting. And is it something I can use in my own practice for my patients with PTSD? But it really, it, it was, it just completely changed my uh, whole perspective and, and created some major shifts. I, I could go on all day. I'll try to wrap it up here. Um, but I was very inspired by, by my own personal experience, what I saw in the other participants that I went through with. And, and also by, by Pam, like I thought the first time I met her, I thought I'm joining her team because what she says really, uh, you know, I think like you said, Julia, it's so inspiring. So, so I was very lucky to get um, accepted to join as a team member. And so I, I've just finished co-facilitating the the last cohort of people through the program and going to be uh, doing it again um, starting next week. Fabulous. And it's really interesting to get the perspective also of a participant. And uh, so, so it's like, I love that you all have different perspectives. What about you, Andrea? 
Thanks. Um, so my name is Andrea Lemp and I, work, I live on Vancouver Island in Canada as well. And I'm a master's trained nurse and I've worked in mental health and substance use for over 30 years. And mostly I, I worked with refractory, what was difficult to treat schizophrenia, depression, anxiety, and in the hospital and community and then developed and ran programs there as well and developed systems. I became a system specialist for working in those programs. But after about 30 years, I became disillusioned because medications could only take individuals so far. I saw a lot of metabolic disease, inflammation in the body, and there was not a lot of connections being made between the two. So I studied, um, I, went, I, turned, I found out about psychedelics about seven years ago. I was doing an integrative psychiatry course um, training in Boulder, Colorado. And um, some of the psychiatrists there were already working with psychedelics. And then I was doing functional medicine training and again, linking up the connection between inf inflammation, insulin resistance, metabolic disorder, that kind of thing. And um, st started working with the Roots to Thrive program from its first cohort. And what I have been really surprised about is that in mental health, you typically have an idea of the kind of individuals who will do well um, on treatments such as, you know, SSRI antidepressants. But what I've seen individuals move beyond and be able to achieve in the SCOPE program in remission and much lower rates of symptom is far beyond anything I've ever seen before. Working with ketamine, um, psilocybin, and also looking at MDMA now. Okay, that's actually a very good, thank you. <laughs> it's actually a very good intro into trying to understand a little bit more about uh, what are psychedelics? There are so many out there. Maybe you can introduce us to some of the main ones that are relevant for health, aging, and longevity. You decide who wants to go. <laughs> well, I think I think to give the landscape, I'm happy to jump in and then and let everyone fill in where I missed or what I messed up. You know, there, there's what we call the, the classic psychedelics, um, that includes psilocybin, MDMA, LSD. Um, there's, there's psychedelic, so psychedelic itself is a, actually a Canadian term. It was co coined in Saskatchewan and it means mind manifesting. Um, it was, it went back and forth between a few, uh, Humphrey Osborne and uh, Osmond. Osborne, Osmond, and um, Aldous Huxley in some letters, and uh, they coined the term uh, psychedelic, uh, um, meaning mind manifesting. So the classic psychedelics are um, LSD, MDMA, and psilocybin. There's some pathogens, ones that make you feel more compassion, more empathy, such as, you know, MDMA, um, also uh, MDA, 3MMC, um, and then there's, you know, there's fungi, well, I mean, these things fall into multiple categories, fungi like psilocybin, Amanita muscaria, and then you have uh, lots of molecules. You have cacti uh, like San Pedro and peyote. Um, I'm sure I'm missing a lot. Feel free to jump in, uh, women. <laughs> what am I missing? Yeah, we have a question there. 5-MeO DMT, another yeah. one, um, synthetic DMT is being studied. Ibogaine, another yeah. one for addiction particularly, and ketamine. <laughs> and ketamine, of course, ketamine. And ketamine. But you asked about, you, you kind of talked about and bringing it into the topic of today's longevity and, and neurogenesis. And you, you mentioned earlier on about telomeres. Um, so one of my research labs, this is actually something we've been working on for probably the last seven years and a lot of the in vivo data around neurogenesis and, and, and these compounds that not only do they cause neurogenesis, but they also uh, decrease inflammation, which is a unique property um, in, a, in compounds. And it's not in a single molecule, it's in these entourage effects. So especially around psilocybin, you see something that the whole constituent of, of a mushroom, you know, when you keep it all together, it has multiple purposes. And, and what we're seeing in the cell lines um, is that you are getting generation and you are getting decreased inflammation which is uh, fantastic when you think about like conditions like Alzheimer's, which where you, you're losing uh, neurons, but you're also having a level of inflammation and po quite possibly, you know, that extends to stuff like multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, and many other like cerebellar ataxia, many other neurodegenerative diseases, like a whole list more, but the potential of something like that with a mushroom to see that in the cell lines and then 
and then hopefully we can extrapolate that into to humans, which I would I would argue that given all the case reports that that extrapolation has has good teeth. So uh, from your perspective, uh, like how do psychedelics work? Because, uh, you know, like when you said, like for instance, when you say, uh, you know, the brain and like the neurogenesis inflammation, you know, it could be one of them could be a secondary effect of the other, um, you know, so like, you know, neurogenesis, you might only be possible, maybe not as a secondary effect, but might only be possible if uh, your information is at a low level or so. So just if you could all share with me, or with all of us actually, <laughs> um, how do psychedelics work? So I can share the part um, that I like to talk to people about, which is, in, this is not the met, like the biochemical part, but um, I oftentimes tell people that psychedelics, um, and I was, usually I'm talking about psilocybin, but it allows you to process your trauma. And sometimes people are like, oh, I didn't really have that much trauma. And there's one traumatologist, he actually refers to, uh, defines trauma as any negative experience that happens in a state of relative helplessness. So this could be, you know, um, for anybody, this could be if you're staying together for the children, you're relatively helpless. If you're at a job that you hate, but you needed to pay rent, you're relatively helpless. And if you're a child, then at baseline, you are relatively helpless. So a lot of these traumas that happened, they start to shape your personality very early on before you're even consciously aware of this. And when you take a psychedelic, you essentially get to revisit those traumas and re, um, kind of rewrite your narrative around it. And the little kind of image that I have for this, um, it's, so when I used to study for med school, my dad would say, go to sleep at night because the little dudes in your brain need to file everything away into cabinets so you can access the information. And I think those same little dudes are taking inventory of your day to day. So every experience that you have, they're like, okay, good, bad, neutral, good, bad, neutral, good, bad, neutral. And when you experience something traumatic, what happens is those little dudes go into fight or flight. They take a screenshot of the image, they crumple it up, they throw it in the back of the brain. Like, we got to survive. And so that little crumpled piece of paper never really gets attention. We very rarely go back to revisit it, but that essentially that crumpled up piece of paper that starts shaping your interaction with yourself, with the world around you, and really starts to impact you. And these are the, where the bias belief systems can start to get uh, uh, developed. And so when you take a psychedelic, the way I say it is those little dudes take some stimulants and they start going through those filing cabinets. They're you know, looking at things like, oh, this wasn't a bad thing. This was actually really good because it helped you here and here and you start refiling it in different cabinets. And that's essentially what we think of when we rewrite our narrative. And around hour three, and we see this in the clinical trial, there's like the certain period where, you know, maybe the more intense emotions come. And what I say is that around hour three, those little dudes are like, oh, what's back there? And they start pulling these traumas out. And the if you're in a proper setting where you're able to process things, you know, this isn't a festival where you have these emotions coming up and nobody's on that level. Um, if you're in a, in a safe space to process it, what happens is you uncrumple that piece of paper and you start going through the trauma. And what's amazing here is that you start going through the actual details. You're remembering details rather than how it made you feel, which is how we usually remember something. And in the process of going through these details, you actually learn things. Like we learn from more from our traumas than we do from our joys, but we don't have access to it. And so here you're remembering what happened you're able to do so without that emotional charge. And then you're able to file it away so that your trauma becomes a part of your story instead of a defining characteristic of who you are. And if you're doing this as some people do recreationally, then I equate this to like, you know, at the end of your journey, you have like a manila folder of semi uncrumpled up pieces of paper just at the top of the cabinet. So you know that something is there, you don't really know like why you feel a little bit off. And that's where some people get turned off from this. Um, and even in our clinical trials, you know, the one of the criteria is, have you had an experience in the last five years or have you had more than 10 experiences in your life with psychedelics? And just yesterday we were talking about, maybe there's gonna be a need to change that question and ask, have you had an intentional psychedelic experience where you came into or in a therapeutic setting? because I think that those will be very different. And people who have had 20 you know, experiences before 
can still come in and have a really profound moment where they get to really process these things. So that's that's my part on that. Fascinating. And actually, Laura, I would love to hear your thoughts because you have experienced it yourself. Sure. Yeah, I, I really like the way you um, you described that, Julia. Um, yeah, so so I um, during the, the so this program that, that we work with um, Roots to Thrive Ketamine Assisted Therapy, it's 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 12 weeks of group therapy, um, sort of uh, where we um, promote and kind of learn uh, resilience. It's kind of that's the, the, the goal of, of the therapy is in the small groups we work with. It's like resiliency training. Um, and three times throughout those 12 weeks, we have an opportunity to do a ketamine session. Um, so, um, so, so each of the ketamine sessions for me was very different and not at all what I expected. Um, and um, yeah, so, so the, um, uh, I'm, I'm losing my track of thought. So, so each, the, the first experience was kind of ketamine mild. It was a, a low dose that, that we did. It was a sublingual uh, lozenge. Um, and my experience with that, I, I went in thinking, um, you know, I'm just going to be open to whatever happens. And, and is there, is there a new path I'm supposed to follow in my life or is, am I stuck somewhere? Like just kind of these open-ended sort of questions. And, and I just had this pleasant kind of floating upside down in nature kind of experience. And, you know, there's, there's lovely music that plays while you're in the ketamine uh, kind of carried me through. Um, and so, you know, and I, I did a lot of journaling after that. And then a couple weeks later, or no, I guess it was about a week later, um, was the second opportunity to do ketamine. And that was a higher dose. Uh, intramuscular and um, and with that one I thought I would just take off from the, the previous one and just carry on you know maybe lose you know dissolve my ego and float up into the sky or something like that but but instead I kind of went down this deep dark hole and I think I was in there finding those little crumpled up pieces of paper that had been tucked away so tight that I didn't even know they were there I I kind of intellectually you know, could remember and tell you about stuff that happened to me in my childhood or difficult experiences over the years. But I always thought, oh, you know, I'm so tough. I've got Teflon and nothing sticks because <laughs> I'd never really actually let let myself kind of sort of be with with those difficult past experiences. So, um, yeah, so it but I didn't really realize it at the time in the ketamine. I was in this dark, tight, sort of really uncomfortable space. I, I just couldn't get comfortable and I didn't know what it meant. I was really disappointed. But it was afterwards, um, like uh, the next day, I think I went home and I slept and I kind of tried to figure out what was going on. And I was out uh, outside running, which I love to do, thinking about love. I was listening to a love song and getting emotional. I, I thought about turning it towards myself and then I actually started to feel it and I had never felt that before I, I could have told you I love myself because it makes sense I think I'm worthy of love but that was all up here I started to feel it down here and then um and then I kind of reflected back on some really helpless experiences that I'd had as a small child and you know and I really like how you how you describe that Julia so um and uh, using some of the tools that I learned in Roots to Thrive about sort of emotional regulation, emotional freedom techniques, with Pan, which Pam teaches us, I was able to just kind of let that stuff come up and just be with it. And it was painful. And, you know, I hadn't had feelings like that for decades. But, but I was in a place where I knew I could handle it and I was safe. And so it, it came up. And, and then I, I was able to let go of this deep fear that I'd had forever. Um, and that led to some of these big shifts, like uh, in the anxiety that I kind of constantly felt has, has mostly dissolved. I used to have this huge fear of speaking in front of strangers. And, and you know, now that seems to have mostly gone away. Um, so yeah, the, um, so that's my experience. My third ketamine session, I went in with an intention of loving kindness or sort of I did a meta meditation going in and, uh, and it was wonderful. I, it was all about love. I just, I became love. I was at one with the universe, you know, all that stuff that actually I felt that and it was just amazing. So yeah, that's my experience. <laughs> Thank you very much for sharing. Yeah. 
Andrea, do you want to uh, share your some of your thoughts? Yeah. Um, so just tagging into what Pam and Julia and also Laura have said, what I've noticed um, in individuals with depression and anxiety is that the research shows that they have, as has already been said, reduced neural connectivity in the brain in areas associated with emotional regulation. And Julia was talking about the default mode network. And really that's our autopilot. So it's our conditioning and it's our go-to condition pathways that are literally our default mode. And what I've noticed, what I've really noticed is as we go into the ketamine and psilocybin, um, these overreactive modes in individuals with depression, anxiety, and trauma, um, it reduces that mode. Like for example, psilocybin can reduce that mode and kind of reboot the brain and allow you to view your situations as everyone has already been saying from a non-conditioned and compassionate way. And when you bring in the connection with other individuals as we do in the group psychotherapy, that's really where the magic happens. So, um, it's, so when you do these medicines in connection, which is um, it allows us to really start to peel back the layers of trauma and anxiety and depression and as we begin to peel them away, we are able to identify, as Julie was saying, strengths that we didn't even know we had and view those situations from a very, very different way. And, um, and when you do that with connections, when I was looking at the social determinants of health, I was thinking, you know, top on the list would be things like, you know, diet and exercise and not smoking and um, not use sub low substance use, but really, and having good air to breathe, but um, lowest was the good air to breathe and highest on the list was social connection. So loneliness and social connection um, tied in with the psychedelics are really um, what makes the magic of, of the psychedelic medicines. And um, in our group work, that's what we've seen. It's really fascinating because uh, there are a lot of connections to aging, obviously, as we're talking about longevity, health, longevity, and there are several things that come up, you know, uh, I mean, yes, women, especially uh, perimenopausal, menopausal, <laughs> postmenopausal women are more likely to suffer from uh, depression, anxiety. Um, so I, I definitely see something there where it can help. Well, actually, one thing that I'm uh, very curious about is as we age, uh, obviously, we spend more time having different experiences. For me, then the question comes up, does that also mean that potentially as we get older, we have more piles or higher, bigger piles of those crumbled up uh, papers that we didn't look at and maybe they become, you know, like, like in a trash can when you just keep stuffing stuff in and then stuff like starts deteriorating, does that get worse? And is then more, uh, basically more psychedelic therapy necessary or would we use different psychedelics? What are your thoughts about that? Well, that's a big question. I'll jump in here and, and, and I let everybody like tease it apart a little bit more, but I, you know, a lot of people that when they introduce themselves, they introduce themselves as biohackers. And so to tie that all in to what you're asking and that is like, keep in mind, like these are layers, right? Like little layers you put on your life. And I, I have the visual always of, the, of an onion, right? And no, and no one knows what those, how many of those layers they can handle, right? And I would, I argue actually quite strongly that, you know, most people that are achievers, overachievers and really, really driven often have a lot more layers because you're, you're driving hard, right? Like you're driving hard to accomplish because somewhere in there, there is a message. You don't count unless you achieve. You're not good enough. Oh, I'll show them, you know, I'll work harder. You know, these are really common themes in, in when you get, like when you really look at super achievers, you know, not, not good enough, not smart enough, don't belong. I'm a, I'm a, a imposter, like imposter syndrome is ubiquitous in, in healthcare professionals. You know, all these little things, and, um, you know, they accumulate and, and, and in, in some ways I kind of celebrate them. It's those little accumulations that, that can drive you to achieve. But at some point you want to get rid of them because they drive, they drive degeneration, right? If you're, if you're constantly have your cortisol hogging your, your precursors of all your hormones instead of like, like look at pre, like PMDD, postmenstrual dysphoria syndrome. 
or disorder or or premenstrual challenges like if you have cortisol hang hogging all those precursors how do you make the right level of estradiol and the right level of pregnenolone and et cetera, et cetera. Like just all the things that make you feel good and, and have you balanced. How do you get there if you're not in balance because your amygdala as Julia and Laura and Andrea all kind of alluded to, that's what we're talking about, is amygdala is constantly in ah, for some reason, right? And whether it's a big trauma or a little trauma or a million layers of trauma. And so until you can stand down that amygdala, get to that point of what Laura's talking about, love, self-love, I am love, I am worthy um, and get into that parasympathetic zone where I'm good enough. I don't have to do anything. I'm good enough just existing. And, and that what a wonderful place to be no matter what. Um, then, then you start talking about that. This gets into the longevity part. So trying to tie all that in all those strings is that, you know, you have a drive to achieve because of these messaging um, often, not everybody, but it is a big trend um, that is also tied into this fight, flight, flee, freeze, amygdala, alarms going, smaller, big alarms. And then you peel those off and everything starts to balance. So in the longevity field, you know, the more, the more you can be in that parasympathetic more often, right? The anxiety quiets down you can think you're you're in the smart part of your brain like we always talk about that in our program the psychedelics are going to take you out of the dumb part of your brain the ego that's blah 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 blah, blah. and the dictate i call it like the dictator and it's going to get you into this big brain that is super smart and and really can figure it all out and can tell you what is still happening and what's not and but until you get there you're going to be aging so no amount of biohacking is going to work if you still have those seeds or those layers of trauma. Like it'll work to some level, but if you've got your cortisol being chewed up, there's no amount of supplements that are going to balance that out. You might get a little bit more balanced, but why not just get to the seed? Why not get to the wellness and, and layer all those foundational things on it? You know, if you, if you can use a medicine or a technique or, and it doesn't have to be a psychedelic medicine. I mean, there's a lot of psychedelic like techniques, like Laura said, meta, loving kindness, Buddhist, Buddhism, meditation, holotropic breath work, exercise, uh, sex, love, oxytocin, all this stuff, you know, but if you can get those seeds unhinged, those little pieces of paper that Julia uses, I, I always use the term, those little seeds that are planted by the same thing. When you can let them out, let them be done with, let the amygdala go, oh, it's not happening anymore. I'm safe now. Then all these other processes balance out and it become, then it also becomes a lot easier for those that we're working with or ourselves to eat better, to get outside, to spend some time not overachieving, staring at our computers all day long and instead getting out and playing and having fun and doing all those things. So you can see how like, it's so inter, it's myceliated, right? It's all interwoven together and we need to do it all. But psychedelics, I think are a way that get you there a little bit faster and you can still achieve. Like taking a, a getting, getting rid of your drive to achieve that is from that I'm not good enough. It, you'll still achieve because that's how you're wired, right? You just won't be doing it for the, you won't be doing it to prove it to your parents that you are worthy you'll be doing it because just purely your existence on this planet means you're worthy. And I just wanna take that a little bit further with the functional medicine side, if I could, because um, just alluding to what Pam was saying, when, when you have things like depression and anxiety, um, your ability, you have a higher level of ins insulin resistance in your body. So I'm just tying some of these bodily functions in. And, um, you're not able to use insulin to lower glucose and triglycerides. And so that's a huge problem. And it, and it shows up in diabetes, heart disease, and stroke. And then also inflammation in the body. I'm always looking for this in our, in our participants. Um, as they begin to feel better with the ketamine, they're starting to have an awareness of other pieces that they'd like to begin to look at. And individuals with depression and anxiety um, have inflammation that can affect the brain. And inflammatory, high inflammatory markers are associated with increased depression and also suicidal ideations. And this is really important. Um, and there's precision medicine that's being done now on markers like CRP 
C-reactive protein and IL-6 and looking at precision medicine. So how do these things relate depression, anxiety, trauma, and then inflammation and um, markers in the body. And it, it's all connected and it's, it's hard not, to, once you see that, it's hard to pull that back and not see it. And you can't just, as Laura was saying, you can't just push through things. Like once you push through and then something, you know, a disease process shows up in your life, that's when you have to start to pay attention. So that comes back to what you were saying is about how, you know, as we get into menopause and other things, that's when these things start to show up and we have to start paying attention. And so, yes, and when you work with the two in conjunction, the psychedelic medicines and um, lifestyle functional medicine, um, it's, it's very, um, it's like supercharged. And I just wanted to add about, oh, I'm sorry, Julia. <laughs> Just a little, my little piece about sleep. I'm, as I mentioned, a sleep specialist, and I, uh, one of the things that that really I um, was hoping for as I got involved with the the Roots to Thrive and the psychedelic therapy was that I could find something to offer to the many patients I see. The more I look for it, the more I see people referred to me with sleep problems have trauma history. That like everybody's got insomnia. Um, lots of people have nightmares no one's ever asked them about it sometimes I'm the first person who's ever asked them and then we dig a little deeper and it's like oh yeah that's like that's the root of a lot of the problems I'm having and a lot of the people in the lifestyle medicine clinic have have a trauma history so we're looking at um sleep in this uh, upcoming cohort and roots to thrive we've added some uh question uh questions to the pre and post uh questionnaires about insomnia nightmares and we're going to try and drill down a little bit and see um if uh and i feel like it kind of makes sense that that treating you know the root cause and getting at the trauma i think that's going to help sleep and sleep is a huge uh piece of longevity and mental health and yeah cognitive um uh, uh promoting yeah maintaining your cognition as you age Actually, uh, Julia, before you uh, jump in, uh, just a quick question, uh, Laura. Are you also looking at the data from variables like deep sleep, REM sleep, and stuff like that in the study then? Or oh yeah, I so <laughs> I actually I've got one of these uh, aura rings, and I I've been trying to connect with Aura to find out if they want to donate rings that we can use. I haven't heard anything back yet, but but I'm really interested in that. And we haven't really got a, a plan yet for wearables, but that I think is what I yeah would like to do. And I've also um, got a connection uh, with um, a company in Canada called Cerebra that do home um, sort of uh, polysomnography. So the type of sleep study that you get in a sleep lab with all the wires and stuff, they've got this really good technology for doing this at home. And uh, I just last week was talking with um, a, a colleague of mine who's doing some research with Cerebra and they're really interested. So yeah, hopefully we'll get something crossed. like that. <laughs> Julia. Um, yeah, no, the thing I was gonna say earlier is that back room of traumas, we, I, you know, people have like, you know, the quarter life crisis, it comes at, you know, midlife crisis, some kids now they're severely depressed much younger, maybe social media has something to do with their room filling up. And I think when that door bursts open, that's when you when your body collapses, whether it's a mental breakdown, physical um, symptoms, just like, you know, beyond the threshold. Um, so anything we can do to kind of clear that out little by little, I think is going to be beneficial. And then the other thing is, once you feel good, you want to be around longer. So it makes sense that you start looking into longevity, looking into how can you help your community, looking at how can you share this with others. So I think, you know, each person that does get healing from this has an opportunity to be this node for everyone around them. I'm very conscious of the time. I will have so many more questions, but I also want to open up the floor to everybody in just a second. But before we get to that, uh, what would you recommend women to do if they're interested uh, in diving deeper into uh, exploring psychedelics uh, from the research side or for themselves for use? What would you recommend? So, I I, oh, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I just was going to make a plug for this. This, this reading this book is what kind of opened my mind, like it. Uh, to the whole idea. I, when I read Michael Pollan's experiences, I thought, well, for goodness sake, like, that doesn't sound 
bad at all. It sounds really good. And what have I got to lose, you know, trying these things? So that's one little piece <laughs> from me. I think Fantastic Fungi does a great, uh, is a really great movie that can be watched by the whole family and everybody gets what they want from it. And it's a great way just to, for you to learn about it, but then it's a really great entryway to have this discussion with other people about it. It's like a very, you know, pitch it as great cinematography. And at the end, all of a sudden you have this information that makes your parents curious about microdosing for cognitive uh, decline. What's the problem next, Pam, Andrea? Go ahead, Andrea. <laughs> Well, I would I would come into our program because <laughs> I mean, really, that is um, that is the deepest exploration. And I've seen people come in who were just starting to learn about psychedelics and or find a program that looks, you know, comfortable for you um, because it allows you to do a deep exploration that you didn't even know you needed to do. Yeah. I, and I, we, yeah, or any program, any place you're going to do it, make sure that they really do wrap around, you know, like that's, that's one thing we really, if you're going to do a dive, you really want to be held well. And what we mean by that is you want really good preparation and you want a really good team that's really psychedelically aware and will be there for you completely after because for some people, it's a beautiful sail in the park. They get all sorts of great insights into their life and they, it's, it's wonderful. And other people, it's muddy and mucky and sticky and yucky. And you really need a skilled um, team around you that can walk with you through that to give it meaning so that you can integrate it because it's all good. It's all good. Like no matter what, whether it's dark or wonderful, like whether it's unicorns and rainbows or whether you're really in the deep mud it's all good it's taking you forward and you need a team that can really help you if you're if you're feeling a little shaky that can really help you you your inner healer your best person put some meaning to that and to, um to add to the resources that that can be helpful just to walk you forward is there's um you know a little plug for i'm also a board member of the canadian psychedelic association and on there we have the best ted talks that really opened the door into it too. I agree with all the other resources too, but you know, if you want to get some main stage TED talks that in you know 18 minutes kind of give you a bit more a bit more of the what's been going on. Thank you so much.